Welcome everyone to another session of Fiat Free Twitter Space, co-hosted by Trezor. Uh, I hope you weren't fooled by April 1st pranks today. And don't worry, this space will be quite serious. Uh, because tonight we will discuss Bitcoin adoption in two African countries, Zimbabwe and Zambia, with a dear guest, Anita Posh. And Anita is a Bitcoin educator from Austria. She runs uh, a podcast called The Anita Posh Show and is a founder of the Bitcoin for Fairness nonprofit. And recently, Anita traveled to Zambia and Zimbabwe to hold Bitcoin education workshops with the locals. Uh, Anita is also an author of Learn Bitcoin, a book about Bitcoin basics. Welcome, Anita, and thank you for joining today. Yes, hello, everybody, and thank you very much for the invitation. Okay, and before we start, just some organizational matters. This space is recorded and will be published later on the Trezor YouTube channel. Uh, we are going to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with Anita, uh, but you can raise your hand throughout the discussion and I'll give you an opportunity to join in and ask your question. Uh, so, Anita, first of all, uh, could you please describe your project Bitcoin for Fairness? Why did you found it and what is the mission of this project? Okay, thank you. Yes, so um, in the last couple of, of years since I've started my podcast in 2018 and even before when I discovered Bitcoin, I was always impressed by the possibilities that Bitcoin can uh, bring to uh, better the life of uh, billions of people. And um, this was basically my mission from, from that time on. I started to interview people from emerging countries. And uh, in 2020, I traveled to Zimbabwe the first time because everybody in the Bitcoin space has been talking about Zimbabwe and Venezuela, that these are the two countries where Bitcoin is needed the most. And these are situations um, with the hyperinflation there where Bitcoin has the best use case in a way. And I went there to, to research the, the way how people are using Bitcoin. Are they using it and how and um, how high is the adoption rate? What do they know about it and, and things like that. And um, <clears throat> the following years, um, I also had this focus. And last year I decided then it would be good to open a kind of a platform for more people to join. And I had the idea to call it Bitcoin for Fairness because I think uh, this fairness aspect is the most important aspect uh, of Bitcoin because it's the only true, open, neutral, permissionless and uncensorable money that we have. And um, it's the most resistant to government um, bans or things like that. And so um, it's really emerging countries and African countries where it's needed the most authoritarian uh, countries. Um, and this is like um, 4.2 billion people live under authoritarian regimes. That's more of the half of the, the population. And um, so I thought it's really worthwhile to go into this space and to show the advantages that Bitcoin can bring here so that nobody can say uh, Bitcoin is useless and we don't need it. And the reason why I founded this initiative then was to give a platform also to people from these countries uh, to let to to get their voices heard, you know, um, to to go there to connect with them to share my knowledge um, if they want it, like. Um, um, if they open their arms, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to um, explain everything. And I also had the idea that maybe there are Bitcoiners in these countries, but as the adoption is very early, um, they, they haven't found each other yet. And this also um, um, was proven uh, right uh, in my recent journey. So, yes, so the mission is uh, to empower the people there with knowledge about Bitcoin that they can start, can start to use it and um, empower themselves basically, and also connect them to the 
the so-called Western world, um, where um, where the developers are, where the companies are, you know, um, people there are very in innovative, um, but still they need, I, I would say, the connection to abroad. And that was the reason why I started it. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Uh, so let's get down to the details uh, and let's discuss Zimbabwe. So Zimbabwe suffered one of the worst hyperinflations in history. Uh, and in 2008, the Zimbabwean Central Bank printed the $100 trillion notes, I believe this is the highest denominated note that was ever printed and the currency collapsed shortly after so right now it's about 14 years after the hyperinflationary collapse of the Zimbabwean dollar and now after 14 years the people of Zimbabwe once again suffer from high inflation I've seen the inflation is currently around 50% so if you could maybe describe if you discuss this with the locals how does the experience with hyperinflation influence your relation to money Mm -hmm. I think actually inflation is actually higher I think it's like 500% or something mm. like that um, but uh, you're right, um, the Zimbabwean people have seen it now, like in the last 15 years alone, I think they've seen two new uh, currency uh, launches in a way, you know, because in, in 2019, I think, they, um, the government said from one day to the other, basically, all US dollar accounts are exchanged to the Zimbab Zimbabwean dollar now. You can't have US dollars anymore. And the exchange rate is one to one. And don't be afraid, the Zimbabwean dollar is the, has the same value as the US dollar. It's one to one. But you know, in, in the shortest of time, the, the exchange rate, of course, um, uh, went into um, a, 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 let's say, into a situation which was very negative for people. So the value the, of the Zimbabwean dollar, it lost a lot of value. When I was there in 2020, one US dollar um, was one to 60 to the Zimbabwean dollar. And this time it was one to 230. So only two years later, you can see how much the value uh, was going down. And yes, of course, um, the living situation of people is, everything is under the influence of the money situation. Um, uh, there's also a fact that Zimbabwe is a multi-currency country. You can use US dollars, you can use Zimbabwean dollar, you can use mobile money, which then is also Zimbabwean dollar. Um, you can use the South African rand, you can use the Botswana pula. And so every bigger shop um, takes, takes all these payments. Um, so you, in every shop, you have uh, a, a board on the wall which the, with the daily, uh, the, the current rates, exchange rates. So every day when you are buying something, you start to calculate what's the best rate for me because you also can get uh, money exchanged on the streets because the banking system is completely broken. So people rather meet with other people to exchange money. And uh, the, the rates are usually better there than on the bank. Uh, but sometimes <laughs> the, the shops uh, have rates where you need to think or calculate. So what's the better money that I use now? Where, what's cheaper for me? So that's one thing. Uh, you always are, are asking, what's your rate today? And the second thing is, as soon as you have money, you spend it because you know the next day the value has gone down. And that's also um, a fact, you know, for instance, uh, one of my uh, contacts there is Miss Aura. She's a headmistress of a, of a private school. And she said to me, you know, we, we have 120 students. We have only one computer. I would like to have 10. And I then said, okay, how much is a computer here? And she said, yeah, 250 US dollars. So then I donated it in, in Bitcoin to her. And one or two days later, she sent me a picture with the computer. And I said, wow, that was fast. And she said, yes, you have to be very fast here because either it's, it gets more expensive or you can't get it anymore because you, you can't find these um, devices um, so easily. So um, 
the inflation is it's it's a, a daily topic in a way yeah and all the people know that the us dollar holds its value i mean we also know there's inflation with the us dollar but compared to the zimbabwean dollar it's basically a very stable currency so everybody wants the us dollar but it's hard to get so um yeah that that's the basically the situation mm -hmm. so is there actually any legal tender in Zimbabwe is it like Zimbabwean uh, dollar, but the government uh, still tolerates uh, all these other currencies circulating? Uh, yes, I, I, I'm not sure if the others are also legal tender or if they are just uh, accepted, as you said. Yeah, I could I couldn't say it at the moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But people are used to using like multiple currencies on a yes, daily, daily exactly, basis. Yes, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that sounds like. Uh, The peer-to-peer -peer economy is quite developed in there, mm -hmm, <laughs> I would say, mm -hmm. as you say, uh, because like uh, people in Europe, America, we don't actually like uh, exchange our money in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, mm -hmm. especially on a daily basis. If we need like uh, some uh, foreign currency for holidays, we just go to a bank or mm -hmm. some official exchange. So that is uh, that actually sounds like a good environment for Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you're right, because the banking system is broken and people do not trust banks. That's the first thing. Um, for instance, you can't send money with the bank from uh, Zimbabwe to Kenya. It's not possible sometimes, or it takes days and it is very costly. Um, and the second thing, of course, nobody trusts the government. Um, And, mm -hmm. and it's also um, when I'm talking with people and saying, hey, okay, I'm, let's do an interview. What can we talk about or what should we not talk about? People say, please don't talk about the government with me. Yeah, so um, it's a country where people don't have the human right of free speech. That's a fact. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So it's, uh, it's an oppressive regime, you would say. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so in your experience uh, talking to the locals and having these workshops, uh, how are the locals recipient to the idea of non-state money such as Bitcoin? Yeah, it's interesting. So if you tell them about the properties of Bitcoin, that it's uncensorable, that the government can, can't inflate it away um, and um, that they can't exchange it basically to another currency and things like that. People are like, you know, it clicks. You see, you see them, oh, I understand. Yeah. Uh, so it's much easier for them to understand what the use case for Bitcoin is than in Europe, for instance, where we have banks and all these uh, things. But yeah, I mean, but under the impression of this, Uh, decades of uh, dictatorships and authoritarian uh, governments, um, people are still very, how shall I say, do you say obedient to the government in a way? And um, so they, they do ask then, but um, what if the government can't control this, how can we control money? And I tell them then, I mean, to be honest, your central bank can't control the money you see it it's inflating the value is uh, uh getting lower and lower each day so they can't control it yeah and then they are also like oh, you're actually right yeah and some people are laughing in in the in the crowd you know who yeah. i talk to so um i think they are very quick to grasp uh the the opportunity and uh, but it's still the thing that holds most people back is that it has the It's it's a scam, basically. People, everybody in Africa or in Zimbabwe and Zambia almost thinks that Bitcoin is a scam because uh, they have made uh, such bad experiences with a lot of pyramid schemes, MLM schemes, and things like that. And also because financial literacy uh, is, is very low because people are not used to saving money. Yeah? And um, so they believe if somebody tells them you make uh, 200% profit in three months, they believe it. So that's, that's a sad thing. So therefore, we need a lot of basic financial education also in these countries. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned savings. So I was actually um, curious about how able are the locals 
how are they able to save basically because the wages are probably quite low right so mm. um, is it the case they can actually save something and are they like recipient to the idea of saving in bitcoin at least uh, the people you talk to and uh, were at least sort of orange pilled or uh, is the economic reality just prohibiting that uh the reality is basically prohibiting that so as an example miss aura is the headmistress of private uh, private school with two schools and she earns 350 us dollars a month and it's not in us dollars and um her her house her small house where she's living costs her 400 us dollars <laughs> and and she has a child you know so i don't know how people there manage and this is the middle class um the the bigger part of the population is in the informal uh businesses you know they they don't have a job like she has uh they they live from their small farm or from their garden or from hand to mouth or from the things uh that they buy in the morning and then sell on the street in their little street corner shops so they have maybe 100 US dollars a month or 150 so and the prices are actually almost the same as in europe sometimes you know for instance internet um an unlimited landline internet connection costs 300 us dollars a month <laughs> and uh, i mean that's huge because in europe we pay like 40 euros for that and those uh, who have a much lower wage and income have to pay much higher prices and and also the the basic the food uh and and things like that they are not really much um more um cheaper than than here so it's really a thing that they can't really save so and with bitcoin it's even harder so the lightning network um is is the solution for that but nobody knows about the lightning network there so it's really it's really something i mean there are some bitcoin maximalists self proclaimed in in bulawayo in harare and also in lusaka i met them and they know about lightning but also they don't don't use it very much and yeah and also a fact i mean talking with you uh they nobody has hardware wallets i mean um i met some some white people who can travel who have more money they have hardware wallets but all the others um they wouldn't even have access to it and so yes as you say um saving is actually not really possible or or very hard and that's why lightning is so important mm. so who were actually the students in your workshop uh, like where do they come from like are they yeah, like uh, university students or and how did you actually communicate uh, that you are holding these wor- these workshops Okay so um I have been to Zimbabwe two years ago I I said already and uh, I did a talk already in Harare two years ago so and I have a friend living there so she organized the second talk for me and it was in an uh, in the impact hub which is a co-working space where young entrepreneurs meet and uh, you know uh, do their online business and things like that So a lot of people um from that group came to the talk but also um a lot of people by hearsay you know uh, bringing their friends or um guys from a new uh, exchange um they want to fa- found an exchange for Zimbabweans but located registered in um Botswana and uh, they also came because <laughs> And then there was a guy uh, he uh, drove six hours by bus from Bulawayo to Harare because um it was the first time that he was able to meet other bitcoiners. So that was very very wonderful and in Zambia um <clears throat> when I tweeted that I'm going to Zimbabwe uh Indesa contacted me on Twitter and said hey if you're going to Zimbabwe can't you come to Zambia too? here are some bitcoin maximalists and we would really like to do something and we would help you set things up and basically he and two other guys uh, organized everything you know uh, the the talk was at the university of lusaka so the the people who attended were mostly students uh, from the university and then i also in both towns i did a, a workshop uh where uh we learned how to set up a tresor 
And um, in the other workshop, we were talking about setting up an online wallet because a lot of people also didn't have that. And we set up a lightning wallet. And these were also uh, people that were have been uh, or visited the, the talk and were interested in learning more and doing more. And so they attended. And in Zambia, also the great thing, the guys also organized some media interviews for me. So I have been in the biggest um, breakfast radio uh, um, <laughs> broadcast and uh, was, was speaking about Bitcoin and also on a TV station and things like that. And that was great. Uh, and as I said, most people think it's a scam. So you really have to start with the very, very basics. Yeah, I, I see that uh, you are called a Canadian, right? In my article. <laughs> yeah. That's actually funny. <laughs> Yeah, I All mean, right. the, the article was, I, I would say it was not completely correct, but the article was very good, actually. Um, surprisingly good, I say. Only the Canadian was wrong, but, you know, it doesn't matter. Yeah, so uh, you keep mentioning people uh, sort of view Bitcoin as a scam in these countries. Uh, is it because uh, there are like a lot of... Uh, scams after the hyperinflation happened or uh, like what's uh, why is that actually why do people perceive bitcoin as scam uh, because uh, i think that must have started like 2015 or something 2016 uh, 2017 there was the first uh, bitcoin exchange in zimbabwe a zimbabwean exchange they even had a Bitcoin ATM in Harare where you could get, you could sell Bitcoin and get US dollars or the other way around, which is basically sensational. But um, around the same time when we had the, the, the bull market in 2017, um, a lot of um, scams based on cryptocurrency or they said, they said, you can join Bitcoin with us. And mostly it's MLM schemes where you have to buy a package or you have then you have to bring your friends and family um, and they promise you high, high returns. And um, there have been so many scams back then that then the government and the central bank said, uh, no, we're cracking down now on Bitcoin. So uh, the exchange, they, they had to go basically. So uh, the, 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 the ATM was closed down and they left the country. And so since then, um, the, the take of the government is it's so dangerous and we have to protect people from these uh, nefarious um, actions and things happening. And so we don't want Bitcoin here. We want blockchain. Blockchain is good, but Bitcoin, no, we want to keep Bitcoin offshore. And... Um, and I mean, they, of course, also say it because they can't control Bitcoin. Yeah, they know that. And so I think that's that's why people think it's a scam, because there were so many scams in the last years. Yeah. So uh, how is the situation with uh, exchanges and ATMs right now in Zimbabwe? Is everything basically banned? Yeah, it's there's no regulation. But um, from from the, the things that the finance minister says, uh, you guess they don't really want it. But but it's still, yeah, an open space. You, you don't know what's going on. But uh, just from, from the story from the exchange, the guys who are Zimbabweans but registered their exchange in Botswana, they told me they were talking to, to people from the finance ministry or something like that. And the first thing those guys were asking for was a kickback. <laughs> And so, I mean, there's a lot of corruption also in Zimbabwe and Zambia. And so they thought, no, they, they don't do it in, in Zimbabwe. And yeah, so, so there is no framework for companies to do that. And from the customer side, from, from the people side, how they asked me, how do I get Bitcoin? Because uh, there is no exchange in Zimbabwe. Um, mm. And also because there are international sanctions against Zimbabwe and the government in Zimbabwe, most international exchanges don't allow Zimbabweans uh, to buy Bitcoin there. Um, there are some exchanges, I think Huobi is one where you can get Bitcoin when you're a Zimbabwean, uh, but all the others um, don't allow you to do that. 
And that's also the reason why the peer-to-peer -peer trading is so big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually wanted to discuss uh, the sanctions on Zimbabwe because probably most people don't know that Zimbabwe is a sanctioned country. Uh, and you can usually see Zimbabwe in the terms and conditions of these big exchanges. Yeah, so exactly. if, if you're from Zimbabwe uh, and you give uh, your documents to the exchange, you're basically uh, banned from any interaction, right? Mm -hmm, right. Yeah. Um, so, and uh, how do people organize like peer-to-peer -peer trades? Is it like some telegram groups or mm -hmm. uh, have you seen like how, how, how does it work in Zimbabwe? Yes, it's, it's, it's mostly not Telegram because nobody almost in, in Zimbabwe has Telegram. The reason for that is, uh, as I said before, the internet is very expensive. So mm -hmm. most people can only buy so-called internet bundles. So you have, for instance, a WhatsApp bundle or a Facebook bundle, which means um, you can only connect to the internet via WhatsApp. So that's your only connection to the internet. You can't uh, open a browser and type in www. That's not possible. And you also, and that's critical for Bitcoin wallets, uh, you can't download wallets in the Play Store because you can't access the Play Store or the Apple Play Store. Um, yes. So... Um, uh, now I've lost. Uh, what was what was the question? Excuse yeah, me. Uh, how do they organize the peer-to-peer -peer trades? Ah, yeah. So um, these peer-to-peer -peer groups operate mostly on WhatsApp and Facebook, and um, there are all sorts of groups, um, mostly trading groups, crypto trading, and um, so the people build trust in these groups because they start to know each other. And then if new entrants come in, uh, they refer people to the ones they already know. And when I was there, we founded a WhatsApp group for Bitcoin only. And uh, there we have some people who are already uh, into this helping others out with exchanging money. And that's also was what I did there. Uh, it's very, very easy. I exchange, exchanged Bitcoin for 1,000 US dollars or something, and I got it cash, and this is done in like 10 minutes, you know? So, um, but first you have to find these groups. So basically, I think that's the, 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 the difficult thing to find the first connection into these groups. And in Zambia, it's the same. In Zambia, I needed to exchange Bitcoin to the local currency, which is called Guacha. And, um, they also have a WhatsApp group uh, where they are trading. And the guy who knows me, he basically played uh, human escrow, escrow for me <laughs> and vouched for me. And so it was also very easy to get the money. Um, but I also heard that the, these WhatsApp groups, um, they do KYC people. So <laughs> uh, because there have been so many scams, they say, oh, there, there are these community people. You can come to this guy and show him your ID. And then you are allowed to enter the WhatsApp group because that's the only uh, tactic uh, or strategy they have to keep scammers out, hmm. which is also funny again, right? <laughs> because you then yeah. may, again might need an ID, but maybe also the word from your friend is okay, you know? Yeah. So uh, yeah, let's let's discuss Zambia because uh, that's actually a country I haven't really heard about before uh, compared to Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is quite famous for its hyperinflation, but I'm curious about how is uh, the situation with uh, Zambia currency. Uh, I believe they maybe had hyperinflation like some decades ago, uh, but it has been mostly stable right now. Is that the case? Yes. Yes, I think the, the Zambian national currency, the Quacha, is uh, very stable compa compared to the Zimbabwean dollar. I think they also had 20% inflation or so last year. So they also know what inflation is. And But the, the general situation is a little bit better in Zambia. I, I had the impression also internet connection is better and not so expensive. But they also have a great problem with uh, corruption, especially with police. I mean, I came into a situation which I've never, ever had before in my life. And I think I will never have in, in European countries uh, where they basically, they took me as a hostage here. Yeah? <laughs> uh, they sat in the car and my friend had to go out to the mobile money agent to cash some money out so that he could pay the police. Um, and then they left again. So, And he said to me, 
that's a very common thing. Uh, in the year before, the, the population or people said to the government that that has to end. Yeah, I mean, they, they were basically uh, milking the, the people. Yeah, and they do it in, in the open view. So it was in the middle, in the center of town. I sat in the car, the policeman next to me and in the, in the, in the front seat. And I was alone in the car with them. And yeah, uh, then they, they went off when they had the money. Oh, so yeah, that's scary. It's it's also, and uh, they have a new government now, uh, which seems to be a bit a little bit better, because uh, the the prior the, the the government before that one, this was also a very authoritarian country uh, government, and these both are countries. Uh, if you, for instance, wear the color of the opposition party, and it's an election campaign or something then you might get uh, hurt, yeah. So they, they really, um, um, how, how is it called? They, they attack people from the, the opposition party and things like that. Mm. Yeah, so we've got Sovereign as a speaker joining in. So I guess uh, you want to ask some question. Hello, can you hear us in Sovereign? All right, uh, so maybe maybe later. Um, okay, and what's the situation in Zambia with uh, Bitcoin exchanges and ATMs? In mm -hmm. Zimbabwe, it basically doesn't work, as you said. And Nothing. In Zambia, mm -hmm. in Zambia it's different. Uh, in Zambia, there is one uh, uh, registered exchange, which is Yellow Card. Uh, Yellow Card has, I think, now 15 or 16, um, um, is in 15 or 16 African countries now. And it's the first exchange in the country. And they also sponsored a big billboard on, on a high street. And uh, people <laughs> were asking me what this Bitcoin and this billboard means. And I told them, yeah, that's the exchange yellow card. That's where you can exchange your quacha to Bitcoin. So, and, but I know there's not, no uh, ATM yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's much a better situation. Uh, mm -hmm. so so Sovereign, can you hear us? Would you like to ask some question? Uh, hmm, probably not. Um, okay, so another thing I wanted to discuss is what's the language situation in Zambia and Zimbabwe? Uh, I believe their um, official language is English, but there are many local languages. So... Do people like study uh, in English or is it like their local language? Uh, and I'm also, of course, asking this in the context of like Bitcoin educational resources. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in both countries, English is uh, an official language. And in Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe has 16 official languages, which I think Shona and Ndebele are the biggest ones. And English is the first language of most white Zimbabweans and the second language of the majority of black Zimbabweans. So they mostly speak two languages and sometimes English is not very good. And uh, in Zambia, uh, they even have 72 languages. And, uh, <laughs> but English is the official language and also the, the major language in business and education. Yeah. So, so, so the the English English um, educational material is is good, uh, but I think, um, like for instance, my book that was basically also sponsored by Sovereign, who are here now. That's great. Um, they, um, I'm, um, it will be translated uh, to Shona. I hope this year it also will be translated into three Nigerian languages at at the moment. And mm -hmm. uh, I also plan to do infographics, you know, because the, the education of most people is not that good or they might not be interested in reading a 190 page book about Bitcoin, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. So they need the basic principles, how to store your own keys, how to send a transaction and things like that. And I would like to do some infographics on that. And then you also can change very easily the languages. Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds good. And uh, are you aware of any like a uh, Bitcoin educator in these countries that would maybe communicate in their language, not English? 
Have you inc- encountered uh, anyone? Uh, I mean, maybe Kuda, Kuda from Zimbabwe is doing that. Um, n- n- no, but it's, it's, it's really, adoption is very early. And in Zambia, I met Ndesa. He's also writing for Fifi Finance, which is also a, uh, these are also Bitcoin maximalists and they write articles about how to use Bitcoin in Zambia. Mm. And um, yeah, so, so there are a handful of people and I also uh, heard that uh, the, the guys in Zambia, they would like to organize a Bitcoin conference in their country. So that's also something I'm thinking about, maybe organize a conference in Zambia, um, which would actually be great. Yeah, sounds cool. So Stefan Cole is joining as a speaker. So Stefan, do you have some question? All right, I don't know what's happening with <laughs> people joining. Um, okay. Can you hear me now? Hi. Yeah, I can. Oh, okay, great. Mm-hmm. I've, I just had an issue here. Okay, yeah, uh, hello all together. I just have one question um, because, uh, Anita, you mentioned that many people over there are afraid of scams because they had a bad experience or there were some scammers uh, in the past. But um, how can you convince them that, for example, another wallet that you may present is not a scam? Or what, what do you tell them? What, what can they do that they really trust in there? I think it very, it's very much the, the, the being there, the personal presence, uh, the way you talk with them. I think it's building trust. I mean, it's the same here. I mean, I also trust people who talk with me in a way that I can understand. Uh, I, 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 I trust them because they always, um, how shall I say, are ethical, correct, and things like that. And I think that's, that's basically the thing that's uh, missing in all these educational efforts. There is a lot of online education, but um, if you don't know where to start, where do you start, and how do you know uh, what is not a, what's not a scam? And... Um, <clears throat> I, 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 you're right. I mean, I could also sell them something, yeah. But then the, 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 there was also a guy I, who was scammed uh, four years ago. Um, so he joined Bitcoin, and um, I told him that Bitcoin is an internet protocol, and everybody can use it. You don't need a permission and things like that. And after five or ten minutes talking, he says to me, "Okay, um, what are you are you going to sell me now?" And I said, nothing, nothing. I, I'm, I'm only here to share my knowledge. You have to do that on your own. Yeah, I'm only here as a guide. I, I want to help you, but I, I don't take your money. I don't want your money. And so it really, I think it's the personal factor. It's, it's just they're showing up, talking to them, answering their questions, and, and also telling them, I'm also telling them the signs, what they should look out for, uh, that they can see it's a scam or that they, they, you know, their alarm bells ring. I see. So you don't recommend a special wallet or, or you just uh, oh, give some I examples do. of, of um, open source wallets? Or what really, do you recommend exactly. Then? Exactly. I only recommend open source wallets. I tell everybody the difference between an exchange wallet, which is basically a bank account that can be censored or taken away or whatever, And that self-custody is the way to go. And I show them also how to do that. I see. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, okay. And uh, is there a special wallet Do you rec- uh, what you recommend? Or do you just show them what exists and let them choose what they uh, think the, it's best? At the moment, I, I tend to uh, recommend the blue wallet and or the moon wallet, which depends mm-hmm. because... I think for beginners, the moon wallet is perfect in a way because you only have one balance. You don't need to know which is which and you can uh, earn lightning uh, over podcasting or, or whatever. Uh, and you can also use Bitcoin. Um, but the problem with moon, in my opinion, is that it doesn't use the standard seed. And it starts with asking you for an email. And I tell everyone, you don't need an email to mm-hmm. use Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. So they want so the... It's yeah. skeptical then, yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's the one thing. And the second thing is, uh, which we don't think about because we don't know that, a lot of people don't even have an email account there. Mm-hmm. They only have either a, a old Android smartphone or a feature phone. You know, these old Nokia phones where you can send text mm-hmm. messages. 
So uh, the moon wallet for many of them, you, you can't use it because in the first step you have to use an email address. And the next step is then uh, you, you get the, the recovery kit and it doesn't have a standard seed and you have to save the recovery kit on Google Drive or a Dropbox or on your device and they don't have a computer <laughs> mm -hmm. and no internet. Yeah. So I take the blue wallet because it's also Bitcoin and Lightning. But then the question is, so how do I get now my Lightning into Bitcoin if I want to save it? <laughs> <laughs> then you have to go through all the hoops and loops. You can send it mm -hmm. to Bitrefill to top up your phone. Mm -hmm. uh, you can send it to another wallet or whatever, you know. I see. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Stefan. So there are many obstacles to Bitcoin adoption in these countries. Uh, First of all, it's uh, the earnings uh, potential and uh, the inability to basically save in Bitcoin. The second is uh, uh, the internet. It's too expensive. And uh, as you said, there are like WhatsApp packages and such, not like a general access internet. Uh, then like problems with having actually the devices like laptops or proper smartphones. Uh, and uh, also the government stands so mm, what, yeah. what do you think like uh what would uh, what needs to change in these countries for uh, faster bitcoin adoption what would help these people most cheaper internet and reliable internet um i mean the the most fantastic thing but i think it's not really doable i don't know uh, because i'm not a developer but um bitcoin or lightning over text messages this, this would be really the, the 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 big thing the game changer because everybody is using mobile money there everybody and you you use it with text messages and so mm -hmm. this would be just just a simple you would just send bitcoin now you know uh it uh, everybody would know how to do that and they are also used to send money uh, and uh, over their phone which we actually haven't been before and so um That would be a big thing, but I guess mostly reliable internet and um, and um, yeah, basic education. <laughs> That uh, you know, there are now two Bitcoin-only groups in each of the countries, and we are going to do a a the first meetup will be I, I hope in the next one or two weeks in Zambia, and I also hope that in in Harare people get back together. And I said to them, if you do that, I, I'll come along then also. Um, we do an online call and hopefully we can <laughs> if the, the, the connection is good enough um, so that they, they don't forget about it again, you know, because um, if you don't have the impulse through someone else uh, to get together and do it, I think it won't happen. But then when the first people realize how much it helps them like in their, in their lives to, to, to get money from abroad, uh, to be uh, sent money from their family in, in South Africa or in the UK. A lot of Zimbabweans live abroad because they fled the country. Classical remittance um, use case, you know. So mm. if a, a few people start doing that, I think more and more and more will do. And I, I was talking with Kuda, who is uh, using Bitcoin since, uh, has been using Bitcoin since 2014, to be paid uh, by uh, companies abroad for online marketing. And I said, what, what has changed in the last two years since I've been here? And he said, yeah, adoption, he, he really, uh, uh, he, he experiences that more and more and more people are calling him, uh, want to exchange money and adoption is rising. And yeah, I think it, it needs these small seeds that I'm trying to plant there with the help of others on the ground um, so that it can uh, go into bigger waves of adoption. But yes, I mean, education, internet, and, and the possibility to, to earn Bitcoin, which a little bit is there now with, with the Lightning Network. But uh, the people are so far from you know, setting up a lightning address on YouTube, for instance. I mean, first you have to explain to them the differences between Bitcoin and lightning and which wallet you use and things like that. So that's the next step then, yeah.
Yeah. So are you planning to having any follow-up with the participants of your workshop to see how the seed actually grows? Yes, I, I do. I mean, it's a f in fact, it's that way that I'm now have in Zambia and Zimbabwe. I'm proud to say that I'm a Bitcoin for Fairness is now uh, paying two free freelancers to tell their own storage, own stories on the Bitcoin for Fairness website. And the other one is the chief editor of the Bitcoin for Fairness website now. So, and he's also organizing the local meetup in Zambia. So I'm very happy to say that we basically have now two Bitcoin jobs <laughs> in these countries. And yes, I, I, I plan to stay in contact. And I'm also in the Telegram group in Zambia and in the WhatsApp group. And um, I, I think I also will go back there maybe rather sooner sooner than I thought. <laughs> wow, that's all quite amazing. So um, what countries will you travel to next? Yes, yeah, so the next country. So the first thing is I'm going to Bitcoin Miami next week on Monday. And mm -hmm. then I'll go back to Vienna and from there then to South Africa. So uh, my next Bitcoin for Fairness station is in South Africa. Um, I, go, I'm, I'm, I will go to Cape Town. Uh, South Africa is definitely one of the African countries with the highest rate of adoption. And um, I want to go to Mosul Bay. Uh, there is a Bitcoin community called Bitcoin Ekasi. So mm -hmm. it's a, a township where a, a guy called Hermann, he started uh, a community um, like the one uh, Bitcoin Beach in El Salvador. And they are educating the surfer kids uh, about Bitcoin. And they also are um, trying to get more and more shop owners um, to accept Bitcoin as a payment actually lightning and to use it in a circular economy and i want to visit them and we're going to do a workshop and i already <laughs> said to him i hope i can bring some treasure wallets because um they have six vendors at the moment i think and then there's herman the organizer and so i they would like to have a hardware wallet for each of the vendors and for herman because He's also asking for the donations from abroad. So that would be cool. So that's the next step. Um, and I think it will be, I, I, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that adventure. Yeah, yeah sounds great. And it's, uh, it's amazing that there is actually a use case for treasures in these communities. And like the merchants are probably the most uh, obvious use cases because they actually handle larger amounts of money. Mm -hmm, exactly, yeah. And do you have any other countries planned after that? So that's uh, Zambia, Zimbabwe and South Africa? Yes, yeah, so actually I also wanted to go to Nigeria and now that my book is translated to three Nigerian languages thanks to uh, Excel, Surfer and Dropba, um, I, I might have to go there <laughs> this year. <laughs> And then I plan to go to uh, Latin America at the end of the year, like in November, there's La Bitconf in Argentina. And I also want to visit Brazil because my book is also uh, being translated at the moment to Portuguese uh, by Carol. Um, and um, yeah, it would also, of course, be great to be there when we publish it. Oh, that's uh, awesome. So you will have many translations of your book. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I wanted to ask, we've got like eight minutes left. So yes, if anybody yes. would like to uh, ask his question to Anita, please uh, do it now because Anita has to run in like eight minutes. And uh, before we get any question, uh, maybe could you shortly describe what uh, your book is actually about? It's called Learn Bitcoin, right? Exactly. It's called Learn Bitcoin and it's a, a beginner's guide basically to self-sovereignty. The first part of the book is a, a, a description of why Bitcoin? Why do we need it? In, what's the situation in the world at the moment? What is inflation? Um, <clears throat> what is fiat money? Um, how can Bitcoin be uncensorable? You know, um, all these These fat stories also, I'm debunking them, also the one with uh, Bitcoin's ecological footprint, you know, that it's uh, not uh, a bad thing to have Bitcoin. And the second part of the book is then for people who want to start using Bitcoin. 
So it takes you from the basic steps, um, like explaining what is a self-custodial wallet, um, what is a seed, how can I store it safely, what's a hardware wallet, how do I use it, how do I initialize it, um, um, yeah, to all these things. And so the goal is to get people to the, 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 the station of having their own seed and their own wallet and to be able to keep care of that and do transactions with Bitcoin. All right. That sounds great. So are you bringing any uh, copies of the book to Miami? I hope so. That's why I have to run to the train because I have to go home and to be there tomorrow morning because then my books will be delivered. <laughs> All right, cool. So I'll be sure to pick up a, a copy and uh, get your signature in Miami. Oh, cool. Yeah. Looking forward to meet you. <laughs> yeah, likewise. Uh, so I don't really have any other questions right now. Uh, and it doesn't seem like uh, people are raising their hands. So oh, maybe 2014, you... 2014 has requested, I think. Uh, yeah, but then he disappeared again. Oh, okay. So uh, maybe if you could just... Uh, describe where is the best place to find your content and how to get in touch with you okay so the best place to contact me is on twitter i'm on twitter at anita posh that's one word word with a c between the s and the h then uh the bitcoin for fairness website is at bffbtc.org and we also have a btc pay server for donations so please uh, <laughs> donate And the book is at learnbitcoin.link. All right, cool. And we've got 2014 connecting, so hopefully he'll get to ask his question. Mm -hmm. Hey, 2014, you can ask now. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Anita, I just want to thank you for what you're doing in Zambia. Um, and I'd love to connect with the work that you've uh, been building there. Uh, I, I've been a U.S. Peace Corps volunteer in Zambia from 2018 to 2020, and I was working with small-scale fish farmers in rural Zambia, uh, which mm -hmm. in your experience in Lusaka, it's a bit different out in the most rural areas. Uh, there's no electrical grid, no running water uh, mm -hmm. where I am. Uh, but mm -hmm. there's a great need, and there can be a use case absolutely for Bitcoin. Um, but as you mentioned, electricity is an issue and uh, inter mm -hmm. internet uh, and people often use feature phones and as you mentioned, WhatsApp groups and such. Um, so I just I just would love to connect with you and, and the, the community that you've been building up there. And if I can help, uh, you know, facilitate educational materials uh, translated into local language because uh, Peace Corps has those connections and so on. So uh, uh -huh. I just want to say let's uh, let's keep talking about how we can perhaps work together. And thank, thank you for what you're doing. Definitely. Yes, thank you very much um, for saying that. And yes, please um, um, t send a DM to me on Twitter and I connect you with Ndesa who has the Telegram group in... Um, Zambia, and he's basically organizing everything, and then you can uh, connect. Wonderful. Thanks, thanks so much. Super. Thank you. Okay. So, thank you, Joseph. I really need to go now. All right. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, I won't hold you any longer so that you, <laughs> <laughs> so that you uh, get everything in order before Miami. So, thank you very much, and thank you, 2014, for joining in. Uh, that was a pleasant last-minute surprise that we have actually someone who mm -hmm. has been in Zambia as well. So, I hope you to connect and get uh, everything uh, progressing nicely in the country. Super. Yes. So thank you very much for the invitation and for organizing that. And thanks to all the listeners. All right. Thank you, everyone. And uh, do stop by at the Trezor booth next week in Miami if you are around. All right. So see you, everyone. And have a nice day or have a nice night. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.